Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's presentation on SUNY Plattsburgh's Natural Resources and Ecology MS program. Uh, we are so pleased that you were able to make some time in your day to be here with us. My name is Carrie Woodward. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions, and I'm joined for tonight's presentation by Dr. Mark Lesser, who's an Associate Professor of Environmental Science and Program Coordinator for our Natural Resources and Ecology Graduate Program. Uh, Dr. Lesser, would you like to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, like Carrie said, I'm the coordinator of the graduate program in natural resources and ecology here at SUNY Plattsburgh. Um, I'm also an um, associate professor in the Center for Earth and Environmental Science. I'm a forest ecologist is what my primary research area is in the, in the classes I, I teach. Um, oh, thank you very much. I had just a few quick housekeeping notes, and then I'm going to turn things over to, to Dr. Lesser. Um, first, uh, just so that everyone knows, this is a webinar, not a meeting, so you don't have video or audio, but we do encourage you to engage with us through the Q&A, and feel free to do that at any point in the presentation. Um, we will be uh, responding to you there and may present some of the questions live. Uh, also, we are recording the webinar. Um, we have some students who registered who aren't able to be here tonight, and so we want to be able to send it to them, and we will send it to all of you as well, um, in case you wanted to refer back to any of it. And then also, I just wanted to suggest that you have your cell phones handy, um, because there will be some QR codes um, throughout the presentation that are going to direct you to some web resources where you can do go and do a little bit more um, reading and uh, researching on your own, so have your, have your phone nearby. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on the first slide here. I'm just going to quickly give you a sense of what we'll be discussing tonight. Um, we've set aside an hour for this presentation. I'm not sure if it will take that long, um, but we do have a few of our currently enrolled students in our Natural Resources and Ecology program joining Dr. Lesser, so we want to give them time to speak and, of course, um, have time for you to ask whatever questions you may have. Um, so in this hour or, or less, depending on how much we need, uh, we plan to present you with a complete overview of the Natural Resources and Ecology MS here at Plattsburgh, including the curriculum, opportunities for field experience, and then um, Dr. Lesser is going to explain in uh, some good detail some of the student research and internship uh, opportunities that we have, some of the things that our current students are doing, and then they will come in and share that with you as well. Uh, we're going to also tell you a bit about the career opportunities um, from this graduate program, and then that will um, conclude Dr. Lesser's portion of the presentation, and then I'll wrap things up by giving you just some quick information about what you can expect from the graduate admissions process, um, the costs of graduate programs at Plattsburgh, as well as a pretty robust range of offerings that we have, uh, especially for natural resources and ecology students when it comes to financial aid programs and particularly assistantships and fellowships. So I'll be sharing um, a little bit more information with you about that later in the presentation. So with that said, Dr. Lester, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to you. Okay, uh, thanks, Carrie. Um, so I'm gonna start just by, you know, just a quick overview of what the Natural Resources and Ecology Program is. Um, and really, you know, this is a master's degree, you know, in, you know, where our strengths are in ecology, field biology, environmental policy, and planning. Um, and one of the big things to, to be aware of um, as you consider the program is that we offer a thesis, a research thesis option, or an internship option um, that go along with then the, the, the other coursework that you'd be completing as part of the program. Um, and a really important part of our program is the experiential learning the opportunities that the that the program provides and you know are really embedded within the program and Plattsburgh is really well situated our program is really well situated for um, this type of, of of learning and education with the Adirondack Park on on one side of us and Lake Champlain on the other whether you're interested in terrestrial or aquatic ecology um, policy and planning or some combination of of those two. Um, and so 
the program, you know, is really geared towards studying ecological concepts and methods, um, developing experimental design, spatial analysis, taxonomy, statistical methods, um, all of those sort of skills within the context of, you know, really, you know, applying those in um, um, a real world setting um, and, uh, you know, um, experiential setting. And we have a lot of field-based courses. We have a whole suite of courses that are offered in conjunction with the Minor Institute, which is a nonprofit organization, just a research organization just north of Plattsburgh. Um, and through in conjunction with them, we offer courses in forest ecology, um, wildlife ecology, soil science, um, wetland ecology, water quality and modeling and, and others um, that are all day, full day courses that only meet once a week. And that's a real strength of our program. It allows you in these courses to, to get out in the field to, to really, you know, have really amazing experiences in the regionally um, that a traditional classroom setting doesn't allow you to, to do. Um, we you know, have a lot of faculty besides myself, um, Dr. Mary Aldred, Dr. Tim Myhook, Dr. Danielle Garneau, um, Dr. Colin Foose um, are all actively um, engaged and have currently have students um, in, the, in the program. And there are other faculty beyond that as well, but um, their specialties are in um, wildlife ecology and in soil science and biogeochemistry and wetland ecology and in freshwater and um, stream um, aquatic ecology. Um, and so just to give you a, a sense of what the, the program entails, um, there's three required classes um, in the program. There's a one credit graduate seminar um, that um, uh, typically focuses on some set of, of uh, readings. Um, this past um, fall, we did a, a seminar on kind of classic literature of, of ecology. Um, there's a research methods class, which is geared towards getting all of the, you know, kind of behind the scenes things of, of getting your committee formed and writing your thesis proposal or your internship proposal, getting all of that in place along with some, you know, just generally thinking about um, experimental design and, and other, you know, scientific method. And there's a, a data analysis in environmental science class, which is really digging into how to do um, statistical analysis, but in a very ecologically applied way. Um, and a lot of that being done in the R um, statistical environment and that learning that um, software language is uh, programming language is part of that class. Um, and then the other coursework um, in the program, two classes in the applied or spatial skills um, category, and those are classes like environmental law and policy, um, GIS applications, or public relations writing. We're um, in the process of getting a bunch of other classes um, into, that into that category as well. Um, three classes in the environmental um, science, natural resources category, and those are the classes like I was talking about, the forest ecology, river ecology, wildlife, you call it wetland ecology and so on. Um, two additional program electives, which can come out of either of those two um, cat other categories. Um, and then an internship or research thesis as the final um, part of the, the credits um, that you'd be earning towards the degree. Okay, and so just a breakdown of what that might look like. Um, in your first semester, you might take two of those natural science um, ecology classes, for instance, river ecology and wildlife, but whatever your specialty is, and in conjunction with, you know, in talking with your advisor, and you might take one of those skills um, classes like sustainability. Um, you might also, um, in the second semester, take data analysis and research methods and an elective in the third semester, start really, you know, doing your thesis research or, or internship um, for credit, along with taking the graduate seminar. And in your final semester, continuing your thesis or, or internship um, credits, um, as well as getting um, your final elective if needed. And so an important thing to, to, to note here is that it's not um, a course heavy um, master's degree. Um, and you have time for that internship or, or thesis research as well on in addition to the, the required courses that you're going to need to take. Okay. And so like I said, I don't need to, to belabor this point too much, but you know, 
the field experience is a really important part and, and something we pride ourselves in in this program, you know, with the, the Adirondack Park and Lake Champlain on either side of us, it's really, you know, a wonderful and amazing place to immerse yourself in, in a science career. And, you know, doing this either through a research thesis or an internship um, as your two options. Okay, and so just as some examples um, of, of things that current students are working on, Phil Snyder is looking at, at Browning and Adirondack Lakes. Naomi Hodgson is doing an intern, did an internship last summer with um, the Adirondack Loon Conservation um, Network. Um, you want to... That's carried. Emily Reinhardt is looking at um, mountain biking issues, uh, conflicts around um, what, traffic and uh, and whatnot in the northeastern forest region. Um, Chris Gilman is doing an internship um, with the Adirondack Mountain Club, um, looking at soil erosion of hiking trails in the Adirondacks. Um, Annie Arnold is looking at insect communities within uh, boreal peatland, um, and Megan Bargabos is looking at wildlife habitat suitability um, in a jack pine barrens just north of here, part of the property that, the, that we have access to through the Minor Institute. And I think with that, um, I'm going to, before we move on, Carrie, I'm going to, I've got three students here, and so I'll introduce them one at a time, and they can tell you a little bit about their research and their experience here just for a minute or two. Um, rather than you just listening to me. So first up, we've got um, Kaylee Dole, who just started her master's um, this semester. Kaylee. Hi, uh, I'm Kaylee. I, like Mark said, I just um, started my master's here this semester, but I also did my undergraduate degree here um, in ecology. I just graduated in December. Um, so my research here. I'm in the forest ecology lab and Mark is my advisor. Um, and I'm currently researching uh, bird communities in different aged forest stands at the Altona Flat Rock, which Dr. Lesser said is one of the properties that we have access to through the Minor Institute. And it's a jack pine barrens, which is a globally rare ecosystem. So it's a really, really cool site to have access to and to be able to do research in. Um, and I'm looking at the bird communities there. Uh, based on stand age after wildfire. Um, and then this spring, I'm transitioning into looking at Eastern whippoorwills uh, at the site as well. Great. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, next up, we have Kevin Dernier, who also just started this semester. Kevin. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kevin Dernier. Uh, I am a Another recent addition to the grad program here. Uh, I got my degree in wildlife sciences from Paul Smith College in 2022. Um, I'm on the internship track here uh, compared to the thesis track. Uh, and I'll be doing my internship with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, uh, looking at uh, verifying uh, a method of tracking breeding bird activity budgets using VHF uh, radio tags. Um, and then looking at how environmental factors affect uh, breeding activity budgets, how birds are spending their time rooting or foraging uh, in different environmental conditions. Uh, and right now I'm in the proposal stage. Um, as Dr. Lesser mentioned, uh, research methods is helping me uh, formulate what exactly I'm going to be looking at, what kind of statistical tests I'm going to be doing, um, how I'm going to structure my arguments and all that. And uh, uh, I've applied to some grants, which is very exciting, so we'll see how that goes, and hopefully I'll have some funding to get all my uh, materials for my project, and I should be starting banding and tagging birds in May. Very exciting. Thank you, Kevin. And last but not least, Megan Bargabos um, is going to join us. Hello, um, I'm Megan. Um, I'm a second year grad student. I'm in my final semester. Um, and so there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, I'm doing my research at the same study site that Kaylee is, the Altona Flat Rock. Um, and I feel very lucky to have access to that site. Very unique um, ecosystem. And I've spent a lot of time in the field there uh, collecting forest structure data. And I also have game cameras arrayed out there. And I'm looking at how wildlife are responding to disturbance. So the Altona Flat Rock has burned a few times 
uh, over the past century. And so we're connecting the forest structure data that we have to the wildlife occurrences on the game cameras to see differences in uh, habitat preferences. Um, and while I've been here, I've also been supported with the teaching assistantship by teaching the ecology lab. And that's been uh, very helpful and a really cool experience that I've learned a lot from. Um, and I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Megan. <laughs> okay, so I guess we can move on to the next slide, Carrie. Yeah, and so um, thank you to, to the three of them, all all really great um, and really showcasing the the diversity and and different things going on in our program. Um, as you know you want to be thinking about what's next after this master's degree. Our um, graduates, you know, are going to, you know, be really well qualified, you know, with the knowledge, skills, and experience and credentials to, to pursue careers as park naturalists, as environmental scientists, um, whether that's in uh, the public or private sector, um, with a uh, non-governmental organization, an NGO, or, or a consulting firm, or a government agency. Um, environmental planning, the, the same um, Thing applies field ecologist agency fisheries um, or foresters or wildlife scientists and really lots of, of other career opportunities and these are all fields that are, are growing um, we get um, more and more um, ads coming through the, the the center and through the program looking with people looking um, employers looking for for students to fill these types of positions You're muted, Carrie. Thank you. I can't believe I did that. I never do that. <laughs> I was saying thank you, Dr. Lesser. And uh, before I move on with my section of the presentation, I think this would be a, a good place to pause and um, open it up for questions. Um, so if any of our attendees uh, would like to ask some questions specifically about the academic program, anything that Dr. Lesser covered um, or any of the experiences um, that the students shared, this would be a great time to go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And uh, we'll see if there might be a couple that we could go ahead and answer live. Um, or if not, we can answer those offline too. So Dr. Lester, do you still have the students there? I do not. <laughs> they have uh, <laughs> they have run off. So okay, uh, okay. But I can I can um, you know. Uh, so the first question here is uh, yeah. for Megan, but uh, talking about her experience balancing her teaching duties and coursework, thesis research. Um, the GA position that that Megan spoke of that that she had and that we have an open position to you know that would take over from from Megan um, this coming fall um, is. Um, teaching um, on a section of the general ecology lab. Um, and so anywhere from you know 15 to, to 20 student undergraduate students in that lab, it's a three hour lab a week. And there's some, you know, obviously prep time involved in that. You get a lot of support from the faculty, whether it's myself, Dr. Garneau, Dr. Aldred, um, in, in getting that all set up and, and getting you running in terms of course management and, and helping out with, you know, um, teaching and things. And so um, it's a, you know, if teaching is something you're interested in, it's a incredibly valuable, you know, experience um, to get to, to do that in, in a, you know, as you being the primary instructor in the, in the lab. Um, in terms of balancing time, um, I, you know, I can speak that Megan has done an excellent job of being able to, to do that. Um, and, you know, there's times in the semester where there's grading to be done and there's, um, you know, more prep than others some weeks. But, you know, with the support that you get from the other faculty and an undergraduate um, teaching assistant, um, I think it's really quite, quite manageable and a, and a really valuable experience. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, if you took a class such as wetlands as an undergrad, can you also take it at the grad level? So no, not if you took that class um, at Plattsburgh um, as, part, as part of the program. You can't take you can't take what is 
any of our cross-listed 400 slash 500 level classes a second time, even though it's at the other level of the of the class. But we have more than enough choice in all those categories where we can figure out independent studies if if needed, We um, that, that that's never a problem. We've had many students now um, either finish the program or are currently in the program that were our undergrads here, and they find um, they still have a lot of, of choice in the courses to, um, that they can take as a graduate student. Um, is this a two-year program or does it vary shorter or longer depending on the course load? Um, it is designed as a two-year program, um, but um, in certain instances, we've had um, students who have um, successfully completed the program or are about to successfully complete it in just three semesters. Um, we also have quite a, we have two or three part-time students right now who are planning on taking much longer than than two years um, and working on it uh, more in a um, slower than than the than the two-year plan um, and so you know it's it's variable depending on you know the number of credits you feel or you and your um, ultimately your advisor and committee feel comfortable with you taking um, the internship um, versus the the research thesis might also factor into the ultimately the time that it takes but it's definitely designed to be a two-year program okay next question what are the main challenges to students that have a large gap between their undergraduate um, in this graduate program um, that's a, a good question and I'm not sure I, we have several students um, in the program right now um, who um, would fit into that um, that categorization um, they're all currently doing it the current students are all um, part-time students right now um, and they seem to be doing um, have you know fit back into the academic world um, just fine um, in the capacity that they're they're completing the degree um, I think it's just you know going to be a, a mindset and making sure that you don't you know overload yourself especially especially maybe as the you start back the first semester um, and you know and really you know cultivating a good relationship with with your advisor your committee with the other faculty um, and you know that's something that we really pride ourselves in here is that is those relationships and the understanding that all those people are going to give to you if you take the time to you know to, to cultivate that relationship. Dr. Lesser, I just wonder if you should you could comment a little bit kind of on the flip side of that question. Do you see any benefits for students who have had some work experience prior to coming into the graduate program? Um, I think that can definitely be be the case. Yeah, in my own personal experience, I went back to, to school um, after, after several years of, of working in a completely unrelated field. And, you know, and I discovered that my work ethic and my study habits and all of those things um, had, you know, increased considerably. So it can, you know, it can definitely be a, be a benefit. Um, let's see, another question here. Have any MS students gone on to careers with federal agencies? Does Plattsburgh, Plattsburgh have any connections, partnerships with federal agencies like the Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, et cetera? Um, we have not had any students go on to, to federal agencies um, yet, um, but we also are a very you know, new program. The, this, you know, the Natural Resources and Ecology Masters has only existed for three years, um, and so we haven't had that many graduates yet. Um, the um, graduates we have had, um, one is working with a, uh, I believe, with us for the for the state in New York, or and one with a private consulting company, and one um, has gone on to do a PhD at the University of Vermont. Um, we don't have any formal um, partnerships with those agencies, but all of the faculty here do have have connections that help with you know securing internships and uh, and potentially you know future employment. But but there aren't any formal partnerships. Now. Okay, thank you for those questions. Feel free to continue to enter those into the Q and A, and I'm sure Dr. Lesser would be happy to answer those as I go ahead 
and continue on in the admissions and financial aid portion of the presentation. So first, uh, if you haven't already, you will find our graduate application at plattsburgh.edu slash graduate. Um, as you can see on the screen there, there's a menu on the right hand side where you can choose how to apply. And that's where you'll find the link for the application. Uh, the application is pretty straightforward, pretty much what you would expect from an admissions application. It's not terribly lengthy. You are asked as part of the application to identify uh, three recommenders. Uh, those recommenders are then notified through our application system that you've listed them as a recommender and they're prompted to um, complete a brief form and upload a letter on your behalf. Um, the other piece of the application process um, that I want to make you aware of that is specific to natural resources and ecology is that once you identify that that's the program you're applying for, you will be asked, are you interested in doing research or are you interested in an internship? And then we'll ask you uh, for some further information about your area of interest. And we have a, a drop down there that includes things like a lot of the things that Dr. Lester has been talking about, aquatic ecology, forest and wild, uh, wildfire ecology, environmental planning and management, et cetera. And then there's a, an other option as well if you don't fit into any of those categories. And then we just ask for a brief statement about, it, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about exactly what you're interested in doing in that area um, in terms of whether it's research or an internship. So that's very helpful for the faculty to have that information um, when they're reading your application. And, um, you know, many times, I, I, I don't know, maybe Dr. Lester, maybe all the time, I think a lot of times you do reach out to applicants before a decision is made just to have a little further conversation with them about that. Right. I'll just jump in there. Yes. Really important part of the application process is that, you know, you need to have, there needs to be a faculty member here who is, who is willing, able and willing to take you on um, as their, their student, whether that's in the internship or research thesis track. And so the best thing you can do um, is to email, you know, and all of our emails are, are linked on the, on the um, faculty directory page that you can access through the, the program website. Um, is to reach out to, to faculty members who you think you might be interested in, in working with, um, uh, even you know before you're starting the formal application and start discussing with them, you know if they have opportunities in their lab, if they'd be willing to to help you with finding an internship, whatever the case may be. It's a really important part of the the process. So everything I've described up until this point is kind of part one of the application. Um, you'll you'll create an account for yourself so you can work on the application a little bit at a time. And then once you have it done and you submit it, there's a $75 application fee that you pay. And then you have access to a portal, an admissions portal, which is going to list for you all of the additional items that are required for your application. So you're going to submit the application itself with the fee uh, before you have to worry about submitting all of these other items. So these are the items that you will find on your checklist. Um, so you obviously you'll need all your prior college transcripts um, and we'll be looking for a 3.0 or higher GPA there, but then just also generally looking at the curriculum and we're looking for you know the science background, ideally bachelor's degree in a science discipline. We also require all of our graduate applicants to submit a resume. Uh, along with a statement of purpose. Um, so a little bit more detail for the faculty when they're reading your application as to you know, what, your, what your future goals are and how you see this program fitting into those goals. Um, I already mentioned the recommendation letter. So those would be the three that you listed on the application. Um, and GRE, so we're test optional. Uh, we've been test optional since the pandemic. Uh, so if you've taken the GRE and you wish to submit scores, if you think that they would support your candidacy for admission, then you're absolutely welcome to do that, but we will not be requesting them. They're not required for admission. Um, in terms of dates and deadlines, so the Natural Resources and Ecology Program admits new students in the fall and in the spring. So we've just brought in a spring class. Um, classes started a little over two weeks ago. Um, and so now we're accepting applications for the fall term, which starts at the end of August. Uh, so we're unrolling admissions for natural resources and ecology, so there's no 
firm deadline. However, we do recommend for all of our rolling admissions programs that you aim for completing your application at least six weeks before the start date of the semester. Uh, most people do it much earlier than that, but that will just ensure that we have time to get everything together on our end, get it to the faculty for review, uh, allow any additional conversations that may need to take place to happen, um, and then get a decision out. Uh, this program, just to be really clear, because a lot of our graduate programs have moved um, fully online, this program is not online. This is a fully face-to-face -face program um, at our main campus here in Plattsburgh, New York. Okay, so now we're going to get into some of the specifics. So these are our graduate school costs. Uh, we are a SUNY institution, so tuition is set um, by SUNY at the state level. Um, so if you're a New York State resident, tuition and fees are about $13,500 a year. If you're going to live on campus, which the I will say the majority of our graduate students do not live on campus, but you can if you would like to. Um, then the cost is $30,000 a year for New York State residents. And then you can see the out-of-state tuition and fees and the out-of-state um, bill if you're planning to live on campus. Now, some of these numbers are pretty big, and I don't want you to get intimidated because I am going to be talking a little bit more about financial aid opportunities, and there are quite a few of them in this program. And Dr. Lesser, did you want to just say something about... Um, if students from out of state are selected for an, an assistantship, what happens in that scenario? Um, sure. Um, well, I mean, we do have um, some um, research assistantships through that are funded through external grants, um, and and that this is a case where you know if you are interested in you know in uh, in trying to, to have one of those assistantships, you you really need to be reaching out to faculty members and asking, you know, because that the vetting process for that is going to be, you know, much uh, um, tighter than than for just general ad admission into the program. But out of state tuition um, can be waived um, for for those uh, for people on those students on those assistantships. Yeah, um, kind of on a right now, I believe on a case-to-case -case basis, Carrie, but we're hoping that's something that will continue um, into the future. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, so there is some federal financial aid that's available to graduate students. So I'll just quickly mention, I'm sure you're all familiar with the FAFSA. If you are a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, you're eligible to apply for these federal programs. Um, graduate students submit the FAFSA, just like undergraduate students do. Um, you're eligible for unsubsidized loans up to $20,500 per year. Um, there's also federal work study money that's available for graduate students. And I'm going to tell you about some specific fellowships that we have um, that are, are contingent upon support from the federal work study program. And then there are also federal plus loans um, that graduate students can take advantage of if they um, have fully, if they've maxed out the unsubsidized loans. Okay, so the first category of financial aid that I want to talk about um, is institutional aid with a work obligation. So this is going to include assistantships, fellowships, and positions in our residence halls that are available to graduate students. And I will mention that the deadline for a lot of these programs are, is coming up on February 15th. So if you're looking to enroll for this coming fall, then you would need to be moving quickly if you haven't already started working on these applications. Okay, so first I'll tell you a little bit about graduate assistantships. So graduate assistantships, you must be a full-time student. In these positions, you work either 10 or 20 hours a week. And then in exchange for that work obligation, you receive either a 50% tuition discount at the New York State rate, that's if you're working 10 hours a week, or a 100% tuition coverage if you're working 20 hours per week. And that's all of the tuition coverage is at a New York State rate. Um, and then there's a stipend that's in addition to the tuition discount. So graduate assistants can be eligible for a stipend starting at about $3,000 per year, going up to $10,000 per year, which is paid bi-weekly um, during the academic year. So the deadline to apply for graduate assistantships is February 15th. 
And um, this QR code here will take you to the page where you can access the application. Uh, we do have assistantships that are available specifically for natural resources and ecology students. Um, there's a teaching assistantship that's available in the Center for Earth and Environmental Science, basically assisting a faculty member um, with an undergraduate ecology course. That position is 10 hours per week. So that would be the 50% tuition reduction and a $3,000 stipend. And then there are two uh, research assistantships that are open through our Lake Champlain Research Institute. Um, these are externally funded opportunities. One is a project on microplastics research. That's a 20 hour per week position. So that would be full tuition coverage with a $10,000 stipend. And then the other position is funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and that uh, research on stonefly assessment, I don't know, Dr. Lester, if you can say anything more about that, but that's another 20 hour uh, per week assistantship with a $10,000 stipend. Did you want to say anything more about those assistantships, Dr. Lesser? No, not. Uh, I think you you covered it. Um, yeah, the the Center for Earth and Environmental Science one that that uh, Carrie is is talking about is is the assistantship that Megan is currently on teaching the the general ecology lab, um, and and the other two um, through the Lake Champlain Research Institute. Again, I'll just reiterate that you know reaching out to to Dr. Tim Myhook uh, about um, about both of those is you know really a, a critical part of of applying for, for either of those assistantships. And then you can see on the slide here that there are two other administrative assistantships that are available this next academic year. One is in our accessibility resources office and the other is in our undergraduate admissions office. And you can see descriptions um, for those on the website. Um, those are open to any graduate students. Um, the accessibility resources office assistantship would require living on campus. Um, but feel free to take a look at those. The assistantship application um, applies to all of the positions. So you can fill out one application and check all of the different assistantships that you are interested in being considered for. Um, and then we have a graduate fellowship program. This is the program that I mentioned to you would require that you submit a FAFSA uh, because you have to be eligible for the federal work study program to qualify for, for fellowships. We have two research assistant fellowships that are available to natural resources and ecology students for this upcoming academic year. Um, and Dr. Lester will be the supervisor for those. So I'll let him talk to you a little bit more about what those would entail. All right, and so these are um, research, um, paid research positions where you can, you know, work with, you know, really, you know, any um, faculty member, your advisor, or with, you know, another faculty member on a research project outside of, of anything you're doing for credit. So not your thesis research, not your, your internship um, research or, or duties, um, whatever that might entail, but it allows you to really, you know, to, to engage in the, the program, in the, in the center, um, in your degree um, while getting paid um, and doing really, you know, cool research um, with, with someone on something you're, you know, interested in. Um, Versus, you know, having to, you know, find a, an external job that might, you know, not have much to do with, with your degree and might not allow you to, to take part in other events um, and, and, and functions, things like our weekly seminar series, lunches with, with guest speakers, dinners with speakers, all of these sorts of things that are really, you know, added value to your degree. It, it gives you that potential. Um, I've um, got a, a current student uh, on a fellowship right now working with me, um, and she, you know, at 20 hours a week um, is accomplishing amazing things. We're going to have, you know, a really, you know, high quality, you know, research product um, by the end of, of this semester. And she's, you know, not having to, to work at, at another job while she, she does that. So... So yeah, so as Dr. Lester said, these positions are 20 hours per week and um, the compensation is $19 per hour. So it's a decent hourly wage um, that's paid through the work study program. Um, but you're, instead of, you know, just working in a clerical type of a position, assisting an administrative office on campus, you're working with faculty within your discipline, gaining some really valuable uh, experience. So I would definitely 
encourage you to check those out. So if you're if you're working the full 20 hours a week at $19 an hour for the whole academic year, then, then what you would earn would be enough to cover the full uh, graduate tuition. Harry, can I just make a, a note just for clarification that um, this can be a little confusing sometimes is that you cannot have um, a fellowship if you also if you have an assistance ship, you cannot have both. <laughs> but you just, can apply to both. You can apply for both. definitely. Yeah. And I would encourage you to do that because, you know, better to throw your hat in as many rings as you can and have those options open if at all possible. So you can see the QR code there if you want to read more about the fellowship program. Uh, now I, I want to tell you a little bit about some opportunities within campus housing and community living. So as I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, there are community advocates, programming advocates in our residence halls. These positions are often referred to as resident assistants or RAs at other schools. We just call them something a little bit different here. But graduate students are able to apply for these positions and basically take on some additional responsibilities in the residence halls um, with the undergraduate students in exchange for a free single room and a discount on your meal plan. Um, the application deadline um, for the CA and PA positions was actually last week. I'm not sure if campus housing and community living would be willing to entertain some additional applications, but I think it would be worth asking them if you think you are definitely um, planning to apply to Plattsburgh. Uh, then we, we also have assistant community director positions, um, which we just have a few of those, but Graduate students are very well suited for those positions. It's a, an even higher level of responsibility in the in the residence halls. Um, you know, doing like wellness checks and um, building checks, taking on some higher level administrative responsibilities for campus housing office. But in exchange for those positions, you actually have a free apartment on campus. Um, so not just a, you know, a single room in a residence hall where you're sharing a bathroom, you actually have your own apartment with a, a kitchen and a bathroom and a living area. So it's, it's quite a good deal. Um, I think the graduate students who are doing it have told me that they have been able to balance those responsibilities along with being a full-time graduate student. So I definitely think it's worth looking into. Um, the assistant community director positions are still accepting applications. Um, so check that out for more information. Jim Sherman is the director of our campus housing and community living office, and you could reach out to him directly about those or to the general housing email address. Okay, and then we have a couple of institutional aid programs that don't have any sort of work obligation at the graduate level, and I just want to tell you a little bit more about those. So we have the diversity fellowship. Applications for this program are also due on the 15th. Um, you can see the award levels there for this fellowship um, for this current academic year, ranging from a little over $3,100 per year to full tuition. Um, these fellowships do not require any sort of work commitment on campus. Um, what we're looking for here is for students who can successfully demonstrate that they're going to contribute to the diversity of the graduate program or in the field of study um, that they're looking to enter, the, the discipline that they're entering. Um, you must be a US or permanent resident for these. These are funded by New York State. You have to be full time. You have to be a new graduate student. So these are only open to new students enrolling for this fall. Um, you have to demonstrate that you've overcome some sort of impediment or disadvantage in pursuing higher education and we'll be looking for students who have high intellectual promise uh, and or professional promise. So we have a committee that um, reviews these diversity fellowships and makes awards. We expect the decisions to be made in April um, and notices to go out. So um, similar to what Dr. Lesser was saying before, you can't have a diversity fellowship and a graduate assistantship but it certainly wouldn't hurt to apply for both. And if you get offered both, then you can decide from there which you would like to accept. Um, and then we have the Graduate Opportunity Program. Um, the Graduate Opportunity Program is for students who have graduated from an EOP, HEOP, or SEEK program as an undergraduate. Um, if you graduated from one of those programs, you would know. 
Um, these grants are available for full-time students and they're for any um, graduate level students pursuing a master's degree or a certificate program of at least 24 credits. Um, the award levels are start at $1,000 per semester and go up to full tuition. There is a separate application for the graduate opportunity program, which is also due on the 15th. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. This last slide is just giving you um, some ways to stay in touch with us. Email works great for graduate admissions, graduate at plattsburg.edu. Uh, we've got Dr. Lesser's email address on there as well. We have a graduate assistant who works here in our graduate admissions office. Um, she's a student in our school psychology program, and she manages all of our social media accounts. So you can follow us um, at those handles that you see listed there on the slide and stay in touch with us that way. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you again for joining us, and we're happy to answer a few additional questions if anyone has any. Um, we've got about, looks like about 10 minutes or so remaining, if there's anything else that we can assist with at this point. If not- We're waiting for other questions, um, if there are any. Um, I would, just something I thought of um, while Carrie was going over the opportunities. Um, another um, opportunity, or not opportunity, but but something that, that um, a lot of our graduate students are currently taking advantage of is that the minor institute, which I mentioned before, that we have all these classes in conjunction with, also has residence um, rooms um, that many are at, at a really um, good price. Uh, at a, at a um, rent is is quite cheap, is what I, I've been. I can't remember the exact value, but um, students tell me um, it's it's really nice. And there's um, and so our graduate students there's five or six of them living at the Minor Institute right now in, in single, um, they're all single um, studio style um, rooms with kitchenettes. Um, and there's also common areas and a gym and laundry, um, lots of advantages. Um, and many of your classes will be right there on the Minor campus as well. Um, and so that's something that, you know, if you are interested in, by all means, reach out and I can get you in contact with the, the right people for, for looking at availability and, and costs. Um, so we have a question about the application deadline for assistantships and fellowships. Um, yes, they are due by 11.59 Eastern Standard Time on the 15th. Um, so you will have until then to be able to submit and all applications that are completed by then will be considered. Um, the Graduate Admissions Office just kind of facilitates the process, so we will collect everything and then get it out to the supervisors of the assistantships and fellowships so that they can make the decisions about who they're going to be offering those positions to in the upcoming year. Um, so I can answer the question about when will the admissions decisions be made. So we are in regular contact with Dr. Lesser. Dr. Lesser um, is the person who will be convening the committee to review the applications. And we really do that on a rolling basis. Um, so once applications are completed, typically as, as long as students are being responsive to us, I would say, you know, within two to three weeks, students are getting a decision. Does that sound right, Dr. Lesser? Yeah, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. As soon as your application is complete, um, we, uh, you know, review it, the graduate admission, the our, the. Um, Program admissions committee um, reviews reviews the application, um, and you know I guess we can roll this into the the other question that's up here. Do you have any advice on writing a strong statement of of purpose? You know a big part of that review process is like I said, you know seeing that the the applicant has you know identified a faculty member that they feel strongly about about working with. Even better if they've already talked to them and and, and secured a kind of a informal agreement with them or, or have explored opportunities with them. Um, and so really being you know you know you don't have to have you know, nail down your your specific you know internship or or thesis topic, but but at least having narrowed it down to a, a faculty member and an area of interest you have, the more specific you can be on those things in your statement of interest, um, the better um, things are going to go as the committee is is reviewing it, because we are a you know a 
a small program that, are, that with limited number of faculty to advise students. And so um, we aren't just going to accept, you know, kind of general interest, you know, applications nearly uh, so much as we're going to accept students who have, you know, really thought through why they want to come and work with, with someone here. Um, the next question is, would the admissions committee prefer that a resume or CV be submitted? Um, it depends on, you know, what, what you've been doing, you know, um, and, and I would say that some sort of hybrid between the two is perfectly fine. I would, you know, just encourage you to make sure that all of the, you know, relevant, you know, your education history is on there, any, you know, and work history and especially highlight any, you know, relevant work history or research experiences you've had. Yeah. You know, if you've done independent study as an undergraduate student or, or you know, done a helped on research projects, um, you know, paid or unpaid, um, you know, really make sure you, you highlight those relevant experiences. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions that we have. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Keep an eye out for the recording, which uh, we will be sending out to you tomorrow. And Thank you so much, Dr. Lesser, for, for joining and for bringing the, the students along. It was great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming out. And uh, you know, feel free to, to reach out about any questions you have.